Mari Mari, bienvenidos. My name is Amalia Cordova. I'm a Latino digital curator at the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage. Welcome to the Sixth Mother Tongue Film Festival. Thank you so much for joining us. Bienvenidos, mi nombre es Amalia Cordova. Soy curadora aquí en el Centro de eh, Tradiciones Populares y Patrimonio Cultural, no Smithsonian. Bienvenidos al Sexto Festival de Cinema en la Lengua Materna. I would like to first acknowledge with respect the Piscataway Nation on whose traditional territory the Smithsonian Institution stands and whose relationship with the land west of the Chesapeake Bay continues until today. Gostaria de agradecer com respeito a nação Piscataway, em cujo território tradicional se encontra a Smithsonian Institution e cuja relação com as terras a oeste da Bahia do Chesapeake continua até hoje. Our conversation today will be in English and Portuguese with consecutive translation. Live real-time captioning will be in English and American Sign Language interpretation, both available during today's live program. Nossa conversa será em inglês e português, com tradução consecutiva. A legendagem ao vivo em tempo real em inglês e a interpretação da linguagem das sinais americana estão disponíveis durante o programa ao vivo de hoje. To view the simulcast that includes these services, take note of the link provided in the comment section. If you're viewing this program after the live broadcast, it'll be available on our website with closed captioning. Founded in 2016, the Mother Tongue Film Festival opens on February 21st, which is the United Nations International Mother Language Day. Fundado en 2016, o Festival de Cinema da Língua Materna abre en 21 de febrero, no Día Internacional das Línguas Maternas das Nações Unidas. Mother Tongue is an effort of recovering voices, a cross-Smithsonian initiative involving the National Museum of Natural History, the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage, the National Museum of the American Indian, and the Asian Pacific American Center. We are very grateful to our Smithsonian partners and all the additional partners that we have for their support and extend our thanks to our sponsors, especially to the Embassy of New Zealand for their support for this event in particular. Today, I welcome you to the Women Directors Roundtable presented as part of our first online Mother Tongue Film Festival. As always, we highlight the confluence of cinematic and mother languages, this year with a special focus on the healing power of storytelling. Bienvenidas a nuestra roda de conversa con Mulheres Cineastas, apresentado como parte de nuestro primer festival de cinema de lengua materna online. Como siempre, destacamos la confluencia de las lenguas cinematográficas y maternas, y se año como un foco especial en el poder curativo we invite you to participate in a conversation with four women directors about women's role in cultural and language transmission. We'll be taking your comments and questions in the live chat below, so please participate. <clears throat> if you're new to the festival, I encourage you to visit mothertongue.si.edu to learn more about our upcoming films and events. Your feedback is also welcome on our social media channels. Si você é novo ou nova, ao festival. Visite mothertongue.si.edu para saber mais sobre os próximos filmes e eventos. Deixe seus comentários nos nossos canais de mídia social. Agora, vou dar bem-vinda a nossas convidadas. I'd like to welcome our guest today. Um, Baxara Hanga, writer and director of the dramatic short Hinakura, joining us from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Valeria Golovina, director of the documentary Mahe Aleo Ote Aloha, Our Love joining us from Ukraine, Sofia Pinheiro and Patricia Ferreira, co-directors of Tepco Hachi, Being Imperfect, both joining us from different parts of Brazil. And uh, our moderator for this session, Cass Gardner, a First Nations curator and filmmaker, joining us from Mexico City. 
I also want to note that we have Patricia Ferreira via cell phone connection from her village in southern Brazil. So she will be coming in <laughs> intermittently, probably, but we're hoping to catch her enough to, for her to have a, a part in this conversation. Muito obrigada. Um, please take it away, Cass. Thank you. Thanks, Amalia. Uh, Ani, hello. My name is Cass Gardner. Uh, I'm an Anishinaabe Algonquin Kwe from Kebawak First Nation in what is now called Quebec, Canada. I'm a filmmaker and curator working within the indigenous arts and culture, and I'm really excited to be here with all of you today. Uh, before we begin, can I translate oh, real quick? Of course. Então, ela está saludando. Seu nome é Cass Gardner, é Anishinaabe Algonquin da Kebawak Nação, em o que hoje é Quebec, Canadá. É cineasta, é curadora, trabalhando com cultura indígena, é arte indígena, e muito feliz de ficar aqui com vocês e vai pedir que cada um se apresente. Before we dive into the conversation, um, I'd like to open it up and let everybody say uh, briefly a little bit about themselves and what they've been working on. Um, Bex, let's start with you, please. Kia ora koutou, ngā mahi mahana ki o koutou katoa, ko Bex Arahanga tōku ingoa, no Aotearoa hau, New Zealand hau, ko Kaitahu ko Ngāti Raukawa ko Waitaha oku iwi, and my tribes are Ngaitahu, Waitaha and Ngāti Raukawa. Um, I am a mother of five and I'm a grandmother to four little boys, um, and I'm a filmmaker and I'm a healer that lives in the central, uh, in Wellington, New Zealand, so the North Island of New Zealand, Aotearoa. Kia ora. I'm the writer director of Henikura. Então, Bex deu seu uh, saludo na língua terreu Maori. Ela um, é mãe dos cinco filhos, filhas, e tem quatro filhos que são netos, é cineasta e também é, faz coração. É, ela mora em Wellington, ao norte da ilha de Nova Zelândia. Thanks, Bex. Valeria, do you mind going next? Sure. Hi, everyone. Maloney, uh, I'm Valeria. I'm a Ukrainian filmmaker, normally based in Wellington, but calling today from Ukraine. I'm a director and cinematographer of Mahialea Ote Aloha, and I am a documentary filmmaker, cinematographer, and educator. Valeria está ahorita, uh, Valeria está uh, ligando de Ucrania, ela normalmente mora lá em Wellington também, Nova Zelândia. Ela é diretora, cinematógrafa de filmes documentais e também educadora. Great. Sofia. Olá para todas. Uh, meu nome é Sofia Pinheiro. Uh, junto com a Patrícia Ferreira Paraitiapã, eu co-dirigi o filme Tequachã. E é um prazer e uma alegria enorme estar com vocês aqui hoje. Eu sou artista visual, professora, cineasta e pesquisadora e antropóloga. Não necessariamente nessas ordens. Hello all, my name is Sofia Pinheiro and along with Patricia Ferreira, I'm co-director of Tecohachi. It's a pleasure and a joy to be here with you today. I'm a visual artist, a professor, a filmmaker, a researcher, and an anthropologist, not necessarily all in that order. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Sofia. Um, do we have Patricia through the phone then? or If we don't not. see her, we don't have her. So okay. we'll keep going right. and when she comes in, we'll ask her to introduce her. So wonderful. Okay, so let's jump right into these questions. So my first question is going to be for Bex. So as an Indigenous storyteller, um, storyteller, stories from our ancestors are extremely powerful and often guiding lights that we draw from. Hinekura is a coming of age story set in the past. What time period is this film set in? And as a director, what do we gain from revisiting the historical and Indigenous cinema. I'm thinking specifically um, how it's usually non-Indigenous filmmakers that contextualize Indigenous people in the past. So how has that oh, yeah. um, kind of changed as an Indigenous person behind the lens? Oh, thank you. Good question. Um, <laughs> kia ora everyone. Um, so my film is actually set in 1600s Aotearoa. Uh, New Zealand, so I really wanted to make it pre-colonial for several reasons, um, because I wanted to tell the story about our ancient practices that have been lost since we've been colonised. Um, but also, um, yeah, so I wanted to show, so we've also got in our country, um, we're overrepresented 
overrepresented in a lot of uh, negative statistics, including things like abuse and teen suicide and teen pregnancy and all of those ones that I think um, is prevalent around the world. And so why I wanted to set it then is to show actually that we did used to have ancient practices, that we were a very equal people. There was no hierarchy. Everyone had their place within the tribe, um, within the family, on the earth, and um, and just a reminder of who we truly are, not not the, the sort of slave narrative that's been dumped on us and heaped on us since um, the missionaries arrived, especially on the back of the burning of the witches with us, with our dirty, feminine, everything. I wanted to show that actually we're sacred and beautiful. Yes, I think, oh, sorry, Amalia, would you like that was to? For, that was for Amalia, I was stopping. <laughs> A pergunta é que as histórias ancestrais são muito poderosas e iluminam às vezes o caminho. Então, a primeira pergunta é qual é a temporalidade do filme The Bex e que também o que, que a gente pode iluminar contando essas histórias. Então, Bex respondeu que acontece no século XVII eh, no Aotearoa, que é a Nova Zelândia pré-colonial. Queria contar muito das práticas que se perderam com a colonização e que o país hoje, as comunidades indígenas são representadas muitas vezes em forma negativa. Muito suicídio, muita gravidez jovem, estadísticas negativas, ruim. Mas ela queria mostrar que tínhamos práticas de igualdade social, que não tem sempre essa hierarquia, que tem sociedades com mais igualdade e queria apresentar quem somos nós verdadeiramente não apresentar a versão só dos colonizadores, particularmente dos missionários, que também eh, fizeram muita prática de não valorar as formas tradicionais de sanação coração. Tá? Sim, sí, gracias. Ok. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, unfortunately something that is very true to, I think, a lot of indigenous people globally is these negative stereotypes. And then a lot of films focus on the negative and not the positive. That's something that I really enjoyed about your film was it shows this um, other side that isn't steeped in imperialism and colonialism that in indigenous peoples were extremely sophisticated, extremely intelligent. We had um, so much, we still do, but um, yeah. yeah, we had so much to offer. So I really appreciated that. And um also, actually piggybacking on that a bit, uh, my other question was, um, since this is a panel of women, oh, sorry. No, no, sorry, I was waving to the New Zealand Embassy at Washington oh. DC for the comment. I we just got you were doing up. this. this <laughs> no, 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 I'm sorry. I won't, I won't wave at people's comments anymore. <laughs> sorry. I'll, no, just, no. I'll take this pause to translate. Um, uh, Cass diz que acontece muitas vezes que as comunidades indígenas globalmente são mal representadas, não? Caindo nos estereotipos que são mais negativos que positivos. Então, gosta muito que o filme de Bex apresenta o mundo de outro lado, dos povos indígenas inteligentes, sofisticados, desde sempre. Beautiful. Yeah, so my... Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, we, we need to see all aspects of us. We're, we're all the things, you know? We're not just these, these different tropes that have been heaped on us. And that's what I want, yeah. And I think of, you know, even though it was set in an older time, and that's what a lot of white, you know, imperialists have tried to show, these exotic kind of things. I think if we're in charge of our stories, you know, it's just going to be a further expression of who we are. So it's going to have a different, just, it's, a, it's actually just going to have a different energy about it, you know, because mm -hmm. it's through our eyes, it's through our lens. Hmm. Sorry. Good. Done. Thank you. No, no, don't be sorry. Então, eu queria muito apresentar, é, dizer que a gente tem que apresentar todos os aspectos nossos, da nossa cultura. É, e romper, eh, separar de todas essas eh, representações de fora, essa visão imperialista, exoticista, não? Que a representação das nossas histórias seja em controle de nós, de nossa própria cultura, e que isso dá já uma diferente energia pela pela história. É, é outro olhar, é outro enfoque, é outra tela. Yeah, I totally agree. And that kind of speaks to my other question about the film, 
because as you said, as a director who is indigenous and also a woman, um, I thought that there was just such a rich uh, illustration of female relationships and also uh, the changing relationship that young women have with their bodies as they come into womanhood and have their first um, menstrual cycle or moon time, as we say in uh, the Anishinaabe worldview. Um, and the scenes around the menstrual cycle and blood, for example, are things that we often aren't shown in film, mostly because of this inherent sort of imperial male gaze that cinema has. So I was just wondering if you could expand a little bit more about this idea of indigenous cinema and how we can approach these topics differently. Um, yes. Uh, so, I mean, I did a lot of, <laughs> I did a lot of research, um, but so the way I operate is I, I, um, I'm quite often guided by um, our ancestors with whatever I'm, going to be making so I just do as I'm told um, and so and actually in New Zealand because we've been so colonized there's not very many places where um, where we can shoot films that haven't don't have grass or pine trees which is not which is not native to New Zealand so that whole process was big and so I was very much guided to the different places where we could shoot Hinekura but also um, guided to the different actors that so a lot of the most of the actors in the film that was their first time ever acting oh, wow. yeah as there's only two people that had ever acted and that was the bad man the baddie guy which um he oh. was actually in my first film but he's amazing and it was funny you know the female gaze and the male gaze so many men were like i just want to know where the bad guy's from like i just want to know a story i'm like i don't care about a story wow well. You know, like his story is yeah. not. I'm. I have. I have no focus on his story. I don't care where he came from. He just has to go. You know, yeah. like this kind of. I had, to, I had to have these really kind of quite big arguments with the DOP and with the editor. And I oh, not the editor. The editor was beautiful, but other kind of men involved. Um, but I was very, very lucky in that um, there's a woman in New Zealand who's actually done her PhD on Indigenous menstrual cycles and our oh, wow. and our ceremony around it. So that's um, Dr. Ngahuya Murphy. And then I also had two other people who are tohunga, which is our medicine people. Um, and so because we're an oral tradition, um, all of our ancient stories gets passed down orally. And so mm -hmm. I had, you know, great conversations with them and I got them to read like the draft of the script and just go, you know, is this kind of feeling accurate as, as far as what we know? And they're like, yes, you know, I think maybe they wouldn't do this. And so I was able to really kind of, um, do that but as far as showing um, blood you know the actual menstrual blood I just want to normalize all of those stories like this is who we are you know this mm -hmm. is this is the reality and um, and like let's let's kind of get away with being shy about showing all aspects of ourselves this is you know this is a journey I know when I got my first bleed because I was very much the tomboy um, I didn't even tell my mum, I told my brother. <laughs> so my oh. brother had to, like, my brother, because we were, like, best friends, so my brother had to, like, bike to the shop and get me menstrual pads and, you know. Oh. <laughs> That's great. So, yeah, so, you know, and I and I always wondered if we had ceremony, you know, and but actually we do. So I, I just wanted to bring that back. And I feel like there's a lot of other cultures that have got ceremony that it would be wonderful to bring back for our young women as a way of um, taking away the shame and the and the fear and, and just actually being a real celebration because the reality was, sorry, Amalia, this is going on a bit. No, so it's fine. <laughs> the, the reality was is that, you know, this was the continuation of our whakapapa lines. You know, our whakapapa is our genealogy. You know, this, is the, this was the ability to, um, and all women had total say over, they had full autonomy. But this was the bridging of um, peace between tribes, warring tribes by intermarriage. You know, there's, there's just so many kind of different aspects around the menstrual cycle that's just beyond, you know, the, the transition from, from girl to womanhood. Mm -hmm. So it's just great to explore this. Just to, it's great to be in the space, and actually, the um, whenever people watch the film, it brings up conversations that in their nannies, like oh, I remember my nan talking about something, you know. And even I was in Mexico, and it was people in Mexico talking about it, and 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 there's a lot of sort of grief and sadness with it, but there's also excitement, you know. It, yeah, yeah it's, I, I, it's I I love it. It's been beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, Acas preguntó que 
no filme tem uma riqueza de relações entre as mulheres, entre também a mulher e seu corpo, essa relação que muda com a menstruação, menstruação, né? Então, que como é, é pensar essa cena, como apresentar a sangue, como a gente que não vê muito essa imagem na tela, como é, apresentar e como dar uma olhada diferente, e como é que o cine indígena dá essa olhada diferente com essas temáticas, por exemplo. Então, Bex fala que ela fez muita pesquisa e também foi muito guiada pelas ancestrais, faz o que elas dizem. Devido à colonização também, Onde gravar foi difícil, porque já tem muito lugar plantado com plantas que não são do território tradicional. Não Tem árvores que chegaram de fora. Até gravar para é, apresentar essa temporalidade diferente foi um desafio. Também os atores são muitos que estão é, atuando pela primeira vez. Só alguns têm experiência, como aquele que é o malvado, o homem mau. É, isso é importante ter uma aliada de mulher, porque o, a equipe estava muito intrigado de o, o personagem masculino, eu queria saber mais dela, mas no roteiro ela eu tenho que entrar e sair, não importava, não era sua história, mas ela teve muito apoio é, com a pesquisa de uma doutoranda que fez seu trabalho doutoral com a menstruação, cerimônia, cerimônia de menstruação maori, então tinha um trabalho acadêmico que ajudou a basar toda essa história. E também das toinhas, das chamanes, é, as, histórias, as histórias passam de geração a geração, mas tem um momento de mudança de, de jovem mulher, mulher a mulher. Então, ela perguntou pelas chamãs também ler o roteiro, e elas aconselharam muito. Então, o negócio da sangue, ela quer normalizar mais esse negócio nas histórias, porque é uma realidade. Não ser mais tímida, não tem medo, não mostrar, apresentar todos os aspectos da vida. Ela foi é, mais livre de jovem, assim, tomboy, gostava mais de, de estar com o seu irmão, e quando chegou o seu século, primeira vez, ela não contou a sua mãe, contou a seu irmão, era como o melhor amigo dela, e ela foi quem teve que ir na loja procurar materiais para sua primeira menstruação. Então, quando isso aconteceu com ela, ela perguntava, será que nós também tínhamos nossas cerimônias? É. Eu achava que sim, que seria bom também apresentar isso para outras culturas também a reflexionar e voltar a, a praticar essas cerimônias e tirar esse temor e que seja mais uma celebração. Então, são nossas realidades, é, são também uh, as formas das linhas genealógicas passar. Então, as maiores na cultura dela têm muita autoridade. É, também é momento da menstruação é importante porque os casamentos também segundo as relações entre as diferentes tribos também é importante para o processo da paz das comunidades então, é, quando ela mostra esse filme é, fica com contenta de ver feliz de ver que a gente tem muita conversa com respeito a essa temática lá em México apresentou a gente tem tristeza, mas também muita emoção, muita alegria e acho que é muito bom que tinha essas conversas Thank you. Yeah, that um, really resonates with me as well. I, when I was seeing the film, it was very interesting because we have a similar kind of ritual around a woman's first menstrual cycle for um, Algonquin and Anishinaabe people, uh, where we do, uh, where we go into the woods and you'd have a sort of small little like cabin built for you that you could go and spend alone time um, and just kind of like be with yourself and be in your body, but also your grandmothers and your aunts would come and your sisters. And it was just a year of spending quality time with yourself oh, and the women around you. And you also abstained from berries for a year. So you did a berry fast oh, because wow. the strawberries, one of the first um, foods that the creator gave us, it's literally symbolizing women's ability to uh, create life. And so the abstaining of it is kind of the sacrifice that you um, make as a woman, which is uh, not in a bad way, but framed in a positive way because you are so strong. So um, mm, that was I just really, it. yeah, it's, it's great to see how mm. similar and just the celebration of women that um, always has existed, so. Cass mm. menciona também a ritualidade na cultura Gonka, na Nishinaabe também em Canadá, que a mulher passa uma cabana sozinha, chega avó, tias, irmãs, é humano, para ficar com elas também, mas não pode comer morango, porque o morango é muito simbólico e importante também, então tem a restrição de comer essa, essa pequena fruta. 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, all right, well, I'm gonna take it back a little bit, staying in the same vein, but in the present day, um, this question is gonna be for Validia. Uh, your film focuses on a really adorable older couple, Melly and Avito, who have relocated from the atoll of Tokelau to New Zealand for their child. And in the film, Melly speaks about how everyone in the community is responsible for each other. There's this thread of the importance of reciprocity and how reciprocity helps to um, establish and keep an ecosystem healthy. How did you illustrate this in your film and did it influence your directing style at all? Um, well, as you mentioned, a film is as much as it is about, you know, Melina Vito and their family, it's also about the Tokelon community and the community that's one of the largest Tokelon community in New Zealand. They live in Lower Hutt in the suburbs of Wellington. And in the film, you can see quite a lot of scenes at the Tokelon Hall, which is the main hub for the community and all the people, the elderly people, the Melis and Avito generation spend every second Saturday at the hall, they play dominoes, they sing fatales, they share the stories of you know, migration and coming to New Zealand. But also um, there are a couple of scenes with the mothers group, which is only mostly women from the community, elderly women that gather every every Wednesday of the week where they do crafts, they share stories, but they also talk a lot about their struggles of navigating the Palani Pakeha white New Zealand world and what it means to them being so far away from home. And I think for us, for the whole crew, spending time before filming and trying, you know, to immerse ourselves as much as we could and learn and listen helped us in our, you know, respective roles as a cinematographer and editor and a sound person because everyone was able to build an intimate relationship that still goes and, you know, we were welcomed, we were part of the family and we are the family and we're welcome in the community and we're trusted to tell the story that you know, it is male is an Avito story, but it represents a lot of similar stories for Tokelon families, especially in the 1960s, 1970s, living Tokelon, coming to New Zealand and community for them was, it's their only sacred way and sacred place in New Zealand where they still share their culture, <laughs> where they still share their language. And it's probably the second place after the family where the knowledge and the heritage is being passed on so I think illustrating that in the film, not only as you know, not only as a location or things that people do in the community, but also as a mostly spiritual practice for them as well, was important. And I know from my ongoing communication with Melis throughout the process, it was important for them to acknowledge the community and make sure that everyone in the community understood, you know, what the film was about, what were we making, and also you know, if the community had any needs, they would, you know, get those needs out of the film as preserving memory, preserving language, which is one of the main concerns for elderly Mel and Avito that, you know, New Zealand born Tokelowns don't really speak Tokelown or they don't really know the older ways and they don't really know how it's been spoken in the islands back in the day. <clears throat> Uh, a pergunta para a Valéria, é, que é o filme é de um casal que muda da sua ilha para Nova Zelândia pelo cuidado do seu filho. E, então, uma temática que fica lá dentro é a reciprocidade e que como essa reciprocidade também se faz presente na direção do filme, para dirigir o filme. E a Valéria fala que o filme é dos personagens, mas também é da comunidade. A uh, Tokulan... É, a gente mora, a gente que migra de Tocolã, mora na periferia do Wellington e tem um salão muito importante, que é o centro da comunidade. Ali, eles, como viu no filme, jogam, cantam, contam histórias, é, e suas histórias da migração para Nova Zelândia. É, tem muita cena das mulheres, as mulheres maiores, que se juntam cada quarta-feira, é, falando do mundo também de ficar atrapalhadas no mundo maori e não maori, elas não são parte disso, elas estão ficando morando muito longe de sua ilha. Não? 
Então, com uma equipe cinematográfica, elas têm que construir essa relação com os personagens, mas também com a comunidade. Os personagens estavam muito conscientes da necessidade de envolver também a comunidade. E a gente procurou ser bem-vindo para a comunidade, explicar também para elas o projeto. E muitos delas deixaram sua ilha dos anos 60, 70, e as mais jovens crescendo, morando em Nova Zelândia, já não estão falando a língua, estão perdendo muita sabedoria, essa herança cultural que se pratica só nesses espaços da comunidade, como esse salão comunitário. E também, ali também está a prática espiritual, que se, se quer preservar, a gente está muito preocupada dessa pérdida e também dessa recuperação. É muito importante pela comunidade é, compartilhar do filme e do filme também falar como da, as temáticas que preocupam a elas, como a preservação da língua, as, as tradições e que os jovens não perdam a língua. Thank you. I think Patricia is coming in. Oi, Patricia. Patrícia, bem-vinda. Vocês podem se apresentar um pouco? A gente, cada um, falou um pouquinho oi, onde, onde que está hoje, hoje de dia? Te ouvimos. É, tinha caído a minha internet, desculpa. Uh -huh. é, tá bom. Sou a Patrícia. <risos> e... Obrigado pelo, pelo convite. É, eu não sei me apresentar. Okay. Eu sou do povo guarani <risos> e trabalho com audiovisual faz bastante tempinho já, né? É, com a partir de uma necessidade nossa aqui da nossa aldeia, né? É, como a gente vive aqui nas missões. É... Então, tinha essa necessidade de contar a nossa própria história, né? Então, eu comecei mais ou menos é... a partir disso, né? Para poder trabalhar com vídeo. So, Patricia says apologies. Her internet crashed, um, but she's thanking us for the invite and she's from the um, Guarani nation and she's been working with media for over over 10 years, almost 20 years. And it comes from a place of need, the need to show how we live in our villages. She called them missions because it's where they were very heavily missionized. Um, so we really need to tell our own stories and that is my starting point for working with video. And she's a little bit shy about presenting herself. Okay, great. <laughs> um, thank you, Valeria. That was really, uh, I, I get so many things from that film, especially what you're speaking about, where um, it's an interesting concept of having film be a testament and kind of like um, pres a preservation of the specific people and their knowledge and their language. Um, And I think that you captured that really beautifully. And that kind of makes me uh, think about Patricia's, uh, a part of the film, Teco Ache. And if uh, I could ask Patricia a question similar, in the similar vein, um, there's a scene that was shot in a, excuse my pronunciation, Maua Port in Brazil, where you said that um, you wish you would be able to speak in your mother tongue of Guarani for the film. Um, because it would be more impactful and meaningful, and how a large part of our experience is to recognize that we are imperfect and we're meant to bear witness and endure in this lifetime. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on that and also how your filmmaking helps you to bear witness and endure, if at all. Então, um, Cass estava falando com Valeria do seu filme, que o conceito também do cinema testimonial como uma forma de preservar a vida do povo é a língua, que leva muito bem para a primeira pergunta para a Patrícia. É, lá no filme de vocês tem uma cena num porto, onde você fala de não poder falar no filme em Guarani, 
e que seria muito mais potente, poderoso falar na sua língua no filme inteiro, mas reconhecer também que é parte de ser imperfeita, não? Então, o cinema tem essa possibilidade, é, ajuda a fazer é, testemunho, não? Sobreviver e persistir aqui no mundo. Como age, então, que ajuda a persistir, a perseverança? Acho que capturei tudo isso, Sofia, tá bem? Minha tradução para ela, ok. Te ouvimos, Patrícia. Me estava ouvindo? É para eu falar? Tá, <risos> sim, por favor. É para eu responder? O que quiser. Ou a Sofia. É para ah. você essa pergunta. Como que a não, cinema não. ajuda a persistir é... pelo mundo? Eu acho que o cinema em si né, traz essa essa possibilidades, né, de, de mostrar um pouco a, a, a nossa resistência, tanto como a nossa língua, né, a nossa, a nossa espiritualidade, como que a gente vem resistindo é, a todas essas, essas, essas coisas, né, que, que os não indígenas trazem, né, para a gente. E... e e o objetivo do nosso trabalho é isso, né? Então, falando um pouco dessa cena, né? Do, do Tecoati, onde eu falo um pouco sobre é, a minha... o meu ponto de vista, né? É, Para vocês, ou sobre vocês, né? Que não, quer dizer, os não indígenas, né? Acho que são... É, para vocês não, né? Para os não indígenas em específico. É, porque realmente é uma... É, ao mesmo tempo, eu como Patrícia, né? Eu fico impotente com as coisas que, que acontecem né, com a gente. Principalmente é, pensando nos direitos né, do, do povo indígena. E, e ao mesmo tempo é, sei da minha importância né, nesse, nesse mundo e como povo também, como mulher né, e ao mesmo tempo é, essa é minha língua, né, mantendo essa minha língua né, eu acho que é um orgulho né, falar um pouco, por exemplo, se eu quisesse fazer um filme e falar tudo em Guarani, isso seria uma, uma, uma coisa que eu gostaria de fazer, né, mas também eu entendo perfeitamente que, que isso não será possível, porque realmente eu estou fazendo esse trabalho para os não indígenas verem, então, de, de que eles entendam e, e principalmente respeitem né, o, o, o meu ponto de vista como, como, como uma indígena, né, não somente o meu ponto de vista, mas também o ponto de vista de um povo, né, que, que eles, né, principalmente, é, em que... Em que em que situação que eles nos deixaram, né? Por exemplo, falando hoje, né? Então, acho que isso, realmente, pensando nessas coisas que ali no, na cena do Tecoati, eu, eu falei, né? Que poderia ser mais, mais legal até para mim, né? Falar na minha língua, né? Mas eu me sentiria mais inspirada para falar das coisas que eu sinto, mas, ao mesmo tempo, eu sei que as pessoas que vão me ver, que vão me ouvir, não vão é, entender se, se eu falar em, em, em Guarani, né? Porque eu falo para eles, então eu preciso falar na língua deles, né? É, mesmo achando que são eles que deveriam me entender, 
porque são eles que estão na minha terra, né? Mas, enfim, é, é isso. So, Patricia says that, yeah, film offers us this possibility of sharing a bit of our resistance in our language and our, through our language and our spirituality, how we are resisting all these things that non-Indigenous people bring into our lives. That's the objective of our work. And regarding that scene by the water where I talk about my point of view for and about you, I mean, about you, non-Indigenous people to be specific, um, at the same time, as an indigenous person, I feel quite impotent sometimes with all the things that are happening around me, with my people, the violation of the rights of indigenous people. And at the same time, I do know my importance in this world as a nation, as a woman, to keep my language as a source of pride, to speak my language. And if I could make a film entirely in my language in Guarani, I would love to do that. But I understand that it isn't possible because I need to make non-indigenous people see this point of view, understand my point of view as an indigenous mother, the point of view, not just of myself, but of my nation and what situation they left us. So today, even talking about that scene, I said it would be so much more inspiring for me to even evoke my own thoughts about what I'm feeling out there in that moment if I could speak in my language. But I also understand that those who are seeing this wouldn't really understand and that I have to speak in their language. But really, it's them who should try to understand me because they're the ones who came into my territory. Very true. <laughs> very, <That's>... very true. <laughs> mm -hmm. Language is uh, really so important. And in um, it's uh, something that also you said makes me wonder, do you think there is space um, in the near future or right now to have indigenous cinema in, um, for example, Guarani and have it be film that is uh, enriching and nourishing to just Guarani and other indigenous people. And maybe it does isolate some settlers and uh, non-indigenous people. Então, isso faz pensar, claro, a língua é tão importante e me faz perguntar a Cass, Acho que pode fazer cinema em Guarani hoje, que seja só para o povo Guarani, ou talvez para os povos indígenas, ainda se deixa incômodo aos outros não indígenas? É... Como? Que já haja, se já dá tempo, dá espaço, já... Já dá para fazer cinema só na sua língua, só cinema para o povo guarani. Talvez para o povo guarani e também outros povos indígenas. E sem importar esse outro público não indígena. Ah, sim. É... Sim, é, ao longo desses, desses, desses anos que a gente vem trabalhando, por exemplo, tem alguns que a gente só circula na, nas aldeias, né? Por exemplo, como é, para trabalhar na escola, né? Com outros professores, a gente só não 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 traduz. Então já tem esse tipo de trabalho também. E, e então a, a gente opta por isso justamente para que outras essas outras pessoas, né? Que não não fala guarani, principalmente os não indígenas, né, porque é, a gente é, pensando para fortalecer essa nossa a nossa língua e nossa principalmente para trabalhar na escola sobre remédios é, tradicionais, a gente sempre opta por não, não traduzir, né, os, nem traduzir os, 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 o material, né? simplesmente a gente manda o arquivo bruto né, e para eles trabalharem, que a gente também já, já tem esse tipo de trabalho. Ou às vezes pedem, né, se tem algum, algum arquivo que fale um pouco sobre, sobre certas coisas, como já sabem que a gente trabalha um pouco com isso, então alguns professores é, já pedem se tem algum arquivo que possa trabalhar né, sobre remédios, por exemplo, ou comida tradicional, né? Então, acho que isso 
é, já está sendo, já acontece isso, né? Uh -huh. Sure, um, over these years, uh, we have a lot of work circulating, uh, mainly materials to work on in the schools. So we have that objective in our work. We opt for that when to talk in Spanish, when we know that it's for other people, mainly non-indigenous audiences, um, but we have to strengthen that notion, um, particularly in working in the educational context. When, for example, we teach about traditional medicine, we don't translate anything, <laughs> none of the materials. We send that, what she calls a raw archive and work on it on site. They send the raw materials and then they can unpack it and work on it. So. People even request archives about certain topics. And she mentions, for example, traditional food ways. So they already know that we do this kind of work. So these materials are being shared, but particularly for the educational context. And I wanna make a small point. Um, in the North of Brazil, uh, there was a kind of push to displace indigenous people to settle these coastal towns, right? And then the geography is such that, you know, there are mountains, deserts, and then the Amazon jungle. So the separation was sort of like people's perception of indigenous people is always like they're remote, they're in some jungle somewhere. But in the South, it all kind of comes to a head because Guarani communities are being absorbed by the suburbs of the big cities, the ports of the South. So there's a lot more urban like clashing between the traditional territory and the growing cities that's happening more in, uh, in the case of the Guarani. So, pa, só para complementar, Patrícia, eu falei um pouco de como também a realidade dos povos do sul do, do Brasil é diferente, porque as cidades estão crescendo, estão invadindo o território guarani, que não é tão longe como quando a gente fala de Xingu ou da povos da, da Amazônia. É outra realidade que o seu povo enfrenta, não? que vocês estão sendo invadidos pela proximidade das cidades grandes, importantes. Então, só para complementar, avisei que também esse é o, o contexto. Muito bem. Thank you for that context. Yeah, that's great. Um, I I love to hear that there's a lot of educational resources too, but I also hope that one day we can have um, an indigenous cinema for entertainment as well, that is for the indigenous gaze and the indigenous audience as well. Um, and I'm sure that Patricia is gonna be uh, at the forefront of that. Padre, então, Cass disse que claramente é muito ressonante, que é importante também trabalhar com esse material é, no contexto educativo, mas que ela também espera que um dia a gente tenha cinema é, para os povos próprios, não? Para, para o povo ver suas histórias, é, entretenção também, não? É, diversão também, não, não só as temáticas tão sérias, duras, sino também para... para todo tipo de atividades se representar. Thank you, Amalia. Um, okay, so I have a question for Sofia. <laughs> so, uh, kind of continuing in this vein, your film, Tecoache, also explores the relationship between uh, someone who's indigenous and non-indigenous, as well as someone who's more from a film background, Patricia, and yourself, which has more of an anthropology background. And as the title suggests, we are seeing the imperfect relationship between these um, two forces or entities, anthropology and cinema. So now that you've had some distance between making the film, I was just wondering um, if you've had any kind of ruminations about the relationship between the two um, and can they coexist? And if so, how have you um, found that to be in your work? É, quero traduzir a pergunta. É, então, a pergunta para a Sofia. <risos> Sofia me explora a relação tanto entre a, a vida indígena e não indígena, e também vocês vêm de diferentes caminhar, não? Caminhar diferentemente no cinema e da antropologia também. E a relação imperfeita entre essas duas coisas. Depois de fazer o filme, como é que você acha é, a relação do cinema com a antropologia podem coexistir ou como é que você faz a relação, cria a relação entre elas? É muito complexa, né, essa pergunta. É porque acho que existe, para mim, assim, primeiro de tudo, acho que 
fazer antropologia também e fazer cinema é, está imbricado em construir relações, estar em relações, né, assim. Então, para mim, é um pouco improvável que se faça tanto uma etnografia ou um trabalho antropológico sem criar uma relação com as pessoas com as quais você está trabalhando conjuntamente, né? E fazer cinema é a mesma coisa, assim. Existe, um, a não ser que você faça um filme sozinha, é, você dirigindo, você faz o roteiro, você monta, você traduz, você precisa de outras pessoas, né? Para que esse trabalho também seja feito. Ou seja, são práticas que estão coletivas e de deslocamento, né? Como a Patrícia colocou nessa, essa necessidade, sobretudo. Então, eu acho que talvez seja nesse... Nessa relação imperfeita mesmo, como você colocou, Cass. É, nisso de que é, é, é um... Você dá, você recebe, e essa criação conjunta talvez seja mais potente e mais possível, porque ela é uma criação a partir desse, desse lugar da intimidade, né? Do, do, do acolhimento, assim. Então, acho que a, a antropologia tá, tem, nesse sentido, colaborado muito com um cinema compartilhado, né? Um cinema também que cria relações com as pessoas que estão sendo filmadas e, ao mesmo tempo, as próprias práticas cinematográficas estão corroborando na antropologia para que não seja aquela visão sobre o outro, né, como objeto, uma antropologia clássica que apenas faz filmes etnográficos e talvez não, não pense em colocar aquel, aquelas pessoas como sujeitas ou uma abordagem também como o filme da Bex né, de, ou, ou da Valéria é, com pessoas que são não atrizes e atoras. Então, acho que isso colabora muito para as duas práticas, né? Aqui no Brasil tem algumas pessoas que dizem estar fazendo um cinema que se chama etnografia de ficção. Então, acho que é um pouco sobre isso também. As duas, isso, esse jogo vai se dando e ambos vão se contaminando nessa fluidez. Falei muito, Amália. Tá bom. <risos> so, um... That's a very complex question, Cass. For me, first of all, anthropology and filmmaking imply building and being in relation. So uh, it would be inconceivable to um, to carry out any kind of ethnography or anthropological project without creating those relationships. And it's the same in film. Um, you can make a film on your own, but you really need others to shoot, edit, produce, and script uh, well. So we need to acknowledge that we need others. So perhaps in that imperfect relationship that you say, um, you know, it is a give and take, giving and receiving, and uh, that co-creation that is a result of that may be more possible. Uh, you know, she uses that word very with a lot of intent um, because it's a co-creation, right? Uh, and it's coming from a filmmaking place of intimacy and of embracing something, embracing each other. Um, it's hard to translate the word in, in Portuguese and Spanish, acogimiento. Um, anthropology, you know, has a history also of, of using collaboration in shared cinema projects. And uh, we're looking to build relationships towards subjects and not just subjectivize people, right? We're there, there's a move away from that classic anthropology and ethnographic cinema and not just looking at people as still subjects. Um, so I love about Beck's and Valeria's films that there are actors. Um, and so uh, collaboration is uh, necessarily a starting point for both practices, anthropology and filmmaking. And then there's also another current that she mentions called the ethnography of fiction. So she looks at it like a play, like a playing between and a contamination between these genres with a lot of fluidity. Thank you, Sophia. Yes, it was a, 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 a large question and I in no way mean to put you on the spot and speak for all um, anthropologists 
in the world. <laughs> but I think you've answered that question beautifully. And um, just having so much experience working, um, you know, and, and literally embedding yourself, um, I was just curious about your personal perspective on the matter. Um, and I do agree that, of course, like no person is an island and especially on a film set, certainly no one does that alone, even in documentaries. So um, I really appreciate your comments about um, how there is this building of relationships, which is um, the same in film as well as working with most indigenous ontologies. Então, ela fala, uh, desculpa, não quis uh, você fazer um tratado e representar as duas disciplinas inteiras, mas apreciou <risos> muito seus comentários, sua visão mais personal. E ninguém é uma ilha, falou, não? Que é importante fazer essa ênfase nas relações, e esse jogo entre o cinema e as ontologias indígenas. <risos> Okay, so my my next question is going to be for Valeria because um, there are some similarities um, in your filmmaking style to to um, Teco Ache that I saw from watching them, and I while I was doing my sleuthing, <laughs> I saw that in an interview you had mentioned that you were hopeful that your film Our Love inspires other filmmakers to have the courage to tell unfamiliar stories. So um, this is a bit of a hot button topic, especially recently within um, filmmaking in the film community, which is like who has the right to tell stories and how do we tell these stories? So I was just wondering, I think that your film is a very, is a very wonderful example of um, well-made considerate storytelling when you're not from this community. Uh, and I was just wondering what attracted you to the indigenous people of Toke Lao and how, um, if you have any advice for filmmakers who are working outside of their um, own culture and how can that be successful? Thank you. Um, well, I think where I begin my work, because I have a background in you know, studying and working in different cultures and working with different communities and minority groups. And I think the first thing, probably every filmmaker should ask, is that what's your intention? And that would be different based on your background, based on the politics of the story, based you know, on the community that you're working with. But I think you have to go back to the intention and what are you trying to achieve with the film and how you're gonna go about making it. And for me, um, I was introduced to Mili and Avita family uh, through my MFA advisor. And I think having just arrived to New Zealand from Ukraine, that's the furthest I've ever been and dealing with homesickness, feelings of dislocation, also questioning, you know, where my own creative voice belongs, having lived in different places and not always feeling like I belong. When I heard their story, I sort of felt it in my heart. I felt that that needs to be told and I could see that you know, Mel and Avita really wish to share it, not only with the rest, you know, not only with people in New Zealand, but with people around the world, because um, it's one thing to move somewhere now or move, let's say, from Ukraine to, I don't know, to Spain or to the US or to New Zealand. And it was a very different thing to come from Tokelau, from a small island. If you stay, you know, if you stand in the middle of the island, you could see an ocean on one side and the ocean on the other side and relocate to New Zealand to seek medical assistance for your six-year-old son. That was a totally different world to them. And it was a world that they did not know, they did not belong, and they didn't feel like they could make it their home. So, you know, working through this story and having a lot of sit downs with Nelly and just listening to her sort of life journey in how now her you know, her heart is between Tokelau and New Zealand because New Zealand is now where her children and grandchildren and their kids are born and where they live. So I think sharing that and sharing my own story with Melly helped us build a trust and an intimate relationship. But I also think, um, you know, working on a story 
from the community that you're not from, you need to be really considerate about the other people in your crew that work on the film. And I think everyone you know that we've had on board were really mindful, but they also felt that they had particular reasons and they knew why they're working on the film and why are we making it. Because as much as you know, we wanted to tell a story, we also wanted the community and the family to benefit from making the film, whether that was you know making it in Tokelo and and you know preserving some of their traditions or just having you know just record things and give it to them so they could watch it and pass down, you know, to the to younger generations. I think that's sort of my advice. Um, I also think. I mean, I do a lot of research, regardless of whether I'm making a project about Ukraine or I'm, you know, I was working on a film about Tokelo. I think you really need to dig into the world and try to learn as much as you can and not think that you know, even though you, you know, you might feel you're a filmmaker or an artist and you sort of know. I think it has, it's a lot of, it's a lot of work around it to feel comfortable and also understand, you know, the whys and the what's of working on a, on a film like that. <clears throat> um, a pergunta é, então, um, que faz cas, um, que a filme do Valéria leva a essa temática delicada de eh, quem pode contar a história de quem, não? É, é inspirador ver o cineasta contar uma história bem feita, muito considerada, eh, contar histórias não familiares, não? Mas queria saber o que foi que levou a ela a contar, a trabalhar com essa comunidade de Tocolau e como eh, contar essa história, bem... Então, Valera fala que é onde começa o seu trabalho, não? É com a experiência que ela já traía de trabalhar com muitos grupos minoritarizados, e sempre se pergunta a ela qual é minha intenção. É, tem as poéticas, essas histórias das comunidades também, certamente são importantes, mas sempre não perder o norte de saber bem qual é o objetivo, que é minha intenção para contar essa história. Então, conheceu esse casal, ela estava... Chegada de Ucrânia, sentindo muito deslocamento, muita saudade e perguntando-se muito de qual é sua voz criativa como cineasta. Então, quando oh, estava ouvindo essa história da Meli, do Casal, ela viu que eles queriam compartilhar essa história, que essa história seja contada. E ela também estava morando longe como eles, ela vinha da Ucrânia. Mas a Jo, claro, hoje em dia a gente muda de uma cidade de parte do mundo para outra cidade do parte do mundo, mas o mundo não é muito diferente, mas para eles, do Tocaleu, mudar para Nova Zelândia por conta da saúde do seu filho, era uma mudança radical de vida e do mundo. E nunca se acharam muito em casa lá. Então ela decidiu ouvir, escutar com muito cuidado. E agora ela vê que o casal já tem uma vida dividida lá na ilha e também em Nova Zelândia, porque os filhos, os netos estão em Nova Zelândia. Então, ela teve uma relação de muita confiança íntima com Melly, com a mulher do casal. E, e logo também foi importante considerar também toda a equipe que está participando e gravando lá em, em, na, na comunidade, formar elas de algum jeito, é, para elas também saber bem por que estão fazendo esse trabalho. Eu não sou tão contando a história de um casal, também responder à necessidade da comunidade. Para a comunidade, é importante passar conhecimento a outras gerações. Terceiramente, ela faz, faz muita pesquisa. Acho que é muito importante profundizar o mais possível na temática e não pensar que você já sabe tudo. Então, é muito trabalho chegar a, a isso, mas tem que profundizar também em quais são verdadeiramente as motivações que, que leva dentro. Thank How you. are we on time? How are we doing on time? I think we have a uh, we have time for a few more questions, which okay, is great because I feel like I now just have more things that I want to ask. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for that really thoughtful response, Lydia. I think that there's uh, a few themes that are coming up in everyone's uh, conversation, which is um, intention, keeping an open mind, knowing that you know nothing, <laughs> um, and also just 
being really responsible and when you're entrusted with these uh, stories and going into these communities, which is something that I think a lot of um, people have been talking about in documentary, but specifically indigenous um, documentary as well, is that um, we are, as part of this ecosystem that all of your films touch upon, uh, we are responsible to the people we tell these stories to and the communities. And that kind of helps us to keep um, these morals and these intentions in check. Um, and I'll wait for Amalia to translate that and then I'll go into another question. <laughs> As temáticas que estão saindo em comum das histórias é a questão da intenções de manter a mente aberta, de, no fundo, a gente não sabe nada, não? Mas tem que ser muito responsável é, e também, não só pelo documental e pelo documental indígena, também é, no ecossistema é, audiovisual em que a gente estamos, essa responsabilidade a, aos povos que representa, mas também aos públicos a quem vai contar que história. So, um... My next question is going to be for Valeria and Bex. Uh, both of your films, since, well, first of all, since this is the Mother Tongue Film Festival, uh, there is an emphasis on the importance of language and keeping the language alive. And both of your films did a really beautiful job of highlighting um, the respective languages. Um, but it was also through song and through music. And I really loved how you both end, chose to end your films with these like beautiful songs or um, kind of like musical. Well, I get, yeah, no, it's song too in yours, Valeria, um, and dance. And I was just wondering what was the goal of ending your film that way? And what was the significance of the specific songs that we hear in their native languages? Uh, maybe Valeria, you can go. Well, Bex, you haven't talked in a while, so I'll let you go first. <laughs> Um, kia ora, yes. So um, I ended my film with a waiata, with a song. Uh, but when I initially wrote it, um, I actually wrote it that when she comes back to the tribe, um, they do a haka. And so they haka her back on. So it's, uh, the haka is like the war dance. It's like, come out the, come out the, like, like that. And then um, I was like, ah. Oh. And I was trying to get a haka written for it. And I was like, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. And I was like, because it's masculine, you know, like I needed that feminine expression, that feminine, beautiful, enjoyable um, celebration of the divine feminine. Um, and so when I worked that out, things started to fall into place. And, and actually, um, my producer, Kath, was talking to me about, we had here the um, a Maori queen, so the tribes all combined and there's a and so we had this beautiful queen called Te Atarangi Kahu um, and when it was her 40th inauguration she actually there was 40 female warriors came out of the mist and then they parted and then she just came through the middle and danced and I was like that's that's it you know and so um but I only worked this out like a few weeks before the film shoot <laughs> so I was like ah um and so I've there's amazing um New Zealand musician called Maisie Edeka and she had this waiata and I so I just you know so actually the waiata that I use is modern and it was um it was a little bit of a bone of contention uh, but it was so close mm. to shooting. There was nothing I could do. I just had to kind of embrace that out of the entire film. That was the, you know, that was the one kind of thing that um, was not from the 1600s. <laughs> um, but it was, it ended up being so beautiful. And, and, but actually when we shot the film, it had been raining for days. And um, even the locals were like, oh, this is really weird. We don't get rain like this. And so it was like literally mud up to my knees, like rivers of mud. So it ended up being really dangerous. And where we shot was down on a hill. So people were like having to hold on to a rope and climb down to the set. <laughs> so it's like, oh, hello, Hal. Um, and so when we shot that, when we shot it, we only had like a few takes. And, um, but yeah, it was the reason why we did, we chose a song and to do, to end the film with a song is just celebrating the divine feminine and how glorious we are. Yeah. Thank you. 
Então, é uma pergunta que faz caso para Bex e Valéria, é, como é o Festival da Língua Materna, é, os filmes mostram essa vitalidade da língua, e os dois filmes têm importância muito aos cantos e à música, e também à dança. A pergunta para Bex é, ao final do filme, o é, que é esse canto e qual é seu significado? Bex fala que é um guaiatá, uma cantiga, mas no roteiro original ela pensou acabar com essa raca, essa dança da guerra dos maori, muito conhecida, muito forte. Mas ela olhava, olhava e achava que não dava, porque era muito masculino. E ela queria uma expressão dessa divinidade feminina. Então, a produtora Kath, ela lembrou da, da rainha maori que estava sendo comemorada, comemorada Taita Ranikeahu, e então saíram ali 40 guerreiras dançantes. E o músico é, tinha esse canto, essa guaiata, mas essa música é, em verdade, mais moderna, não é do século XVII. Então, essa foi a, uma, a única variação, a ruptura dessa temporalidade que ela tinha. E estava chovendo muitos dias, é, que era muito estranho, até a gente comentava, ah, isso é muito estranho, que está chovendo tanto né, no tempo de fazer o filme. Estava com geo de lama, estava no morro, a gente tinha que descer com cordas para a cena. Então, não teve muita oportunidade de gravar muitas vezes, só fazer algumas gravações e já. Então, acabou assim, e mais gostou muito, porque ela queria acabar com uma celebração desse poder feminino. Gracias. Valeria? Yeah, I was just like, should I? <laughs> um, you were well, taking um, it in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm um, all the. I'm forgetting that Amalia has to translate, and I talk a lot, and then it's okay. Big chunks uh -huh. of paragraphs. Um, well, for us, um, this the ending song. It's a fatale, which is a traditional Tokelauan action composition, and there are a couple of them featured throughout the film, and we were very lucky enough to have record them on our own and actually have used it in the film. Uh, it was performed during Tokelau Language Week, which is an annual event where, you know, they share culture, language, and their traditions, and community comes together. And the name of the song is Fakatalo Fa'atu, which means welcome everybody to the gathering. And it's sang by Nukunono Group, and Nukunono is an island in Tokelau where Meli and Avita are from. So having that recorded with the Nukunono Group you know, and in Lower Hut, and then having that relationship of Mila and Avita to the song and to the island where they're from, we felt that was a good sort of ending, which sort of symbolizes the whole spiritual, the song, the dance and traditions of the film, but it also sort of questions whether that cycle is going to keep on going because Mela and Avita are probably not going back to Tokelau, even though at the end of the film she says, you know, I wish to go back and die there. And then she sort of reflects that her generation and her kids' generation is now in New Zealand. So we felt sort of bringing that all, all the themes that, you know, we touch on in the film at the end was this celebratory song and dance and actually showing a lot of people from their community and a lot of different generations. Because you can see, you know, in the scene, it's sort of, it's the young ones. It's people of my age and the elderly one that it would sort of be a nice touch which usually gets people to sing and dance if they could I mean and the, you know when we screened it at the hall there were a lot of reflections from people that do know the language and understand the lyrics that how much it means to them and how much you know it means to actually see their people on screen represented in a very good and you know as we talked as Beck said in a very positive way because I think that that means a lot to them so that was our you know, main reason for using this particular fatale at the end and the other reason was that um, Meli herself is a composer and she composes and writes a lot of those fatales on her own and her father um, Ihaia Puka was a famous Tokelon composer so she carries this whole heritage of music and dance in her family and she writes the fatalities on her own that you know we could not have used the traditional songs that are storytelling in themselves at the end of the film. Então, é, 
Para a Valéria, o cantigo final é um fatela, uma composição tradicional, é, mas eles gravaram isso eles mesmos na Semana da Língua Tocuala. Então, a cantiga significa bem-vindos todos a essa reunião. E é uma cantiga que vem da, is, da ilha dos personagens principais, do casal. Então, isso tinha muito sentido, que a cantiga tem uma relação com a ilha e foi um bom final nesse sentido, mas também é uma reflexão da espiritualidade. É um ciclo que não se sabe se vai continuar ou não, porque o casal já vai ficar em Nova Zelândia. Desejam voltar, Meli quer morrer lá, na sua ilha, mas suas novas gerações estão já em Nova Zelândia. Então, queriam celebrar e mostrar muitas gerações é, lá e fechar assim, com celebração. É, e acontece quando ela apresenta o filme nas comunidades que conhecem a língua, que conhecem a cultura, elas começam a cantar e a dançar no final do filme. Então, é, é um profundo significado de ver -se na tela, de forma positiva e, e de fechar com essa cantiga tem sentido. Segu também, finalmente, Meli também é compositora dessas cantigas, de muitas cantigas, e, e seu pai também foi compositor. Então, é, fazia muito sentido é, fechar assim. Great. Thank you so much. I can't believe that was Meli's composition. That's incredible. Wow. <laughs> um, that's just one note. That's not her composition, but oh. there is a composition that her and Avito composed that's featured in the film at a different point. Oh, okay. That's a comp that's a traditional fatale that comes from the island of Nukunonu, mm -hmm. where Meli and Avito were born and lived in Tokelau before they relocated to New Zealand. Oh, wow. It's incredible. All right. Well, I would love to keep asking questions, but unfortunately, we are out of time. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to say really big chumeguich. Thank you to everyone for sharing your experiences and insights. Bex, Valeria, Sofia, Patricia. It's been a real pleasure getting to know you through your work and now through this conversation. Um, And I hope that everybody out there watching uh, gets to check out the films, which are available for free to watch. So please watch them if you haven't already. Um, and a huge thanks to Amalia as well for helping us with the translation and bringing us all together in the first place. Thank you for the audience for participating and to all those who watched, listened and uh, commented. Então, agradecer a todo mundo, a vocês, cada uma, por compartilhar aqui e que os filmes estão disponíveis. Todos os filmes de vocês estão agora disponíveis no, no online, como festival, e que para a gente conhecer mais dos seus trabalhos, olhar os filmes e, e muito obrigada. A cada uma. Ok. Um, I'm going to close. So I would like to um, thank our captioners and ASL interpreters that make this event accessible. I want to thank Sarah Rothman and Kate Haas, who also contribute to making this conversation possible. And thank you, everyone, for your comments. We can't get to everybody's comments, but it's a, really, it's a real luxury to have these conversations at all. Um, please follow the Recovering Voices page on Facebook to get notifications about future events. Find us on YouTube. We have our own YouTube channel at Mother Tongue. Visit our website, mothertongue.si.edu, and come back for our next program. We have an archival film roundtable with the anthropologists as storytellers on Friday, March 19th. Um, muito obrigada. Thank you, everybody. Tchau, See you soon. Mm -hmm.